Hi, everybody. Welcome. 75 people. All right, everybody. Welcome to your Salesforce admin and business analyst user interviews number two. I am Mallory Donahue. I will be your host. And we have Izel Dupizani with us. I see several people have already raised their hands. We need to get this going very quickly. Um, so I'm glad to see everybody's raising their hands. Um, love to see the gifs in the chat. That is how I roll. Okay, let's see if this will let me... Um, go through. Yeah. So welcome back, everybody. Uh, the agenda for today, we're going to do some overview and tips on stakeholder interviews. I know you've already done one of these. And we'll do the stakeholder interviews for 60 minutes. And then Joy slash Izell is going to give some feedback. So format for this, we want one person from each team to ask a question. So Check out, um, you know, make sure you've got one representative from your team just to make sure that we give every team a chance. You all will get to ask one question. So be listening. I won't get too ahead on tips. Uh, your task, you will interview Joy Castillo today. Your goal is to understand how the current state of their Salesforce solutions, as it's been primarily intended for their customer consumer business, and understand future state needs for their B2B revenue play. Okay, so you'll brainstorm these questions, which I'm sure you've already done. Um, before we get started, though, Izel, do you have any tips for user interviews? Yeah, hi, everyone. It's so nice to be with you to, Well my tonight. Um, and uh, yeah, I have a couple of tips. I think I will be repeating myself a little from our kickoff, but just uh, I'll just go through them again is just be um, be on high alert for listening. So that's the mo one of the most, I would argue the most important skill of a business analyst is to be able to listen and really understand um, and let people talk, you know, not interrupt to really just listen to what's being said. So that's the first thing. Um, and then in, in our scenario, uh, but also in real life, you need to listen for what else is being said in the room. Uh, so if someone else has asked a question before, or um, another stakeholder, usually you don't just talk to one person at a time, you'll maybe have a table, a round table of stakeholders to listen to what someone else has also said and try to connect the dots between what is being said or the conflicts um, and so eliciting the requirements from that. Um, yeah, that's the first one. And then I would say paraphrase is what also mentioned in the, the kickoff call. Uh, it's a good way to show um, your stakeholder that you are listening to them uh, as well as to make sure that you understand what they have been saying to you and it can also help you when you see a conflict in what they're saying versus what someone else is saying or even in their own um, speech you can that's a way for you to kind of clarify what's happening um, and get the the root there and then um, the last one that I also mentioned is keep asking why if um, your stakeholder gives you kind of a surface level answer or something that you don't fully understand how that matches back to what they're requesting of you. Um, use, you know, your techniques for getting to the root cause of an issue um, and really understand where a requirement or a statement is coming from. Um, and those are my tips. Wow. Well, Thank you so much, Izell. And then, I'm sorry, I believe Izell's introduced herself to all of you during the kickoff. I'm Mallory Donahue. Yeah. I'm an associate uh, consultant at Slalom, and I am on the digital engagement team there. I posted a few of these, so all of you uh, may know me um, from a couple other experiences. And without further ado, I'm going to bring Gayatri up on the stage and just go ahead, uh, everybody. Use your listening ears and let's kick off. Gatri, what team are you from? Uh, hi, Joe, and hi, Mallory. Uh, I'm from team eight. Okay, uh, 
my question would be um you have uh, successfully implemented salesforce in your b2c so i would like to know what were the challenges you faced while implementing it in b2c and uh, what were the um, three major automations you implemented in salesforce uh, in b2c Oh, um, hi, Kayachi. You're on, uh, asking the tough questions. I wish I had my technical team with me here, but I'll, I'll try to think of, of those automations that we have set up. Um, so I'll start with the first part of your question um, around uh, challenges that we faced when we started implementing. So we're using Salesforce for our sales cycle um, and CRM. And it's, it's very helpful for us. And we've been using it for a number of years. And as you know, our B2B um, side of the business is also now wanting to come on board. And, and that's what this is all about. Uh, but we're also looking for some optimization on our side. Um, we have been using Salesforce for a long time. Um, I think, you know, I have been here for five years and it's already been used way before that. So I'm not exactly sure, but it has been a while. Um, and we just love it, but it is quite customized in many ways to our needs. So, you know, when we started, uh, I, I know, well, that's the stories that I've heard is that, you know, Salesforce is kind of like out of the box, more geared towards the B2B selling. Um, and though it has the option for B2C, it's not um, always as easy. So I think some of the challenges we had was kind of looking specifically at the individual. I think now Salesforce is much more inclined to um, give you that customer C60. And so we've leveraged it off of all these new developments. But I think when we started getting onto the platform, um, a lot of the challenges we had was like focusing on the individual instead of a company. So that was one thing, um, I think. And then, of course, the normal challenges of adopting a new technology. I think at the time when they started using it, um, it was only small parts of the team and they would move from something like Excel or just using email to sell and um, web forms and so on. And then going on to Salesforce. And as we incorporated more teams, um, we moved them off other stacks like HubSpot and so on. So every time we had to do that, there's this kind of resistance to change, adoption, that sort of challenges. And in the past, we didn't handle that so well. So I think that's the first part of the question. The second part, the top three automation. So like I said, I, I am a head of revenue, so I don't, I'm not into the weeds of the system, but I think, you know, we have, um, so we're using Salesforce Marketing Cloud. Um, and I think there's quite a bit of automation included there in terms of getting leads from our web forms, our um, social media pages and so on into our CRM, which is Salesforce. Um, and then I think there's also like a bit of automation regarding reminders to our um, AEs regarding, oh, well, AEs, we call them kind of, you know, sales relationship holders rather than executives. Um, but, you know, we work with individuals. So it's much more bulk than I would say working with companies. But there is this automation around reminding them to follow up on leads um, at certain points in time. Um, I can't think of a third one right now, but I'm sure there are many automations in the system. Um, we can maybe have a session with our tech team that they can take you through that. Thank you. Thank you for the information, Joe. Thank you, Gayatri. Okay, I've got Thomas up here. I'm kind of going fast and furious to make sure we get everybody in. Hi, Mallory and Joy. Uh, I'm with Team 12. Uh, thank you for taking the time out. Yeah, um, really just wanted to get a better understanding of the current state of your Salesforce instance. Um, it sounds like it's heavily customized. It sounds like you're using sales, obviously, and, and you even said marketing cloud. But I'd love to get as much detail as possible from you on what exactly your instance looks like right now, how you integrate the clouds and the customers, and maybe what other additional add-ons you're using in the system. Sure, hi Thomas. So, um, like I said, I mean, 
I, I won't be able to give you kind of the technical level view as the head of revenue, but I can tell you a bit about how we use the system and what uh, what features we use. So we use like the, the basic um, sales features of Sales Cloud. That is our bread and butter, and we really rely on that. So, of course, the contact model, um, opportunities, leads, those are the things we use day to day. Um, then we also have, like I said, Marketing Cloud, and we use a couple of the um, components from, from there. So we use CDP, our, our customer data platform, to get that 360 view of our customers. And we um, use a Social Studio to have our social media engagement. We also um, use Journey Builder to build our email journeys to, um, as well as um, kind of other channel journeys to our customers. Um, uh, yeah, I think there are some other features of Marketing Cloud that is in use today, but I, I can't tell you offhand. Um, uh, that's mostly what we work with. And then, of course, some of the kind of platform automation features within Sales Cloud. Um, once again, I can't go into the detail of that without our tech team here, but that's that's basically what we use. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. All right, we have Rana. And... Um, hi, thank you so much for taking time to speak with us today, uh, Joy. Um, so, um, uh, as I understand, you have a high level of satisfaction with Salesforce, but uh, even though you are happy with this solution, um, are there any pain points with um, your experience today that you hope to fix? Or I can ask these questions like, what are the current areas you want to change or improve to better track the B2C revenue? Um, hi, Rana. Yeah, so, I mean, I think some of the challenges that we face is actually from kind of data visibility uh, and privacy. So when we started out, we had a very open kind of policy to everyone could see anything. Um, but now, you know, with a lot of regulations in different places, we have different teams for kind of EMEA customers versus U.S. customers or other parts of the world. And so um, there's also different uh, regulations within those different regions like GDPR in, in Europe and so on um, and within certain states of America. And so we need to be a much more careful around who can see what, um, especially around customers' personal data. And so that's not a major pain point for us is that right now, pretty much everyone can see everything um, and we've tried to restrict a little bit with like using Salesforce profiles to try and stop that but um, it's not working the way that I would want it to and I think our our team internally is um, kind of struggling to keep up with the requirements they're not sure where to start um, and then implementing that so that's one of the major pain points is kind of the data visibility um, and regional restrictions that we're not, honestly, uh, we're struggling to adhere to. It's a bit manual at this stage. We have to go in and kind of hide certain things from certain people. Um, so that's one of the big challenges that we're facing. I, um, I think the other thing is also, you know, so we have, I'm sure that my colleague Ezra told you about the different plans or the tiers that we have, but we have obviously we have a free version, we have pro, we have business and enterprise. And so for the B2C side, we're looking at the free, obviously, and um, pro, uh, which is still like small teams, startups, that sort of thing. And um, yeah, we're, we're finding it hard to uh, kind of track the free tier folks. So we still want to track them. It's really important for us, especially in trying to um, convert them into paying customers and handing off, in some cases, to the B2B uh, department. 
Um, but, you know, like in Salesforce, we just look kind of at our revenue. So we're looking at the, the paying customers, which probably in our case would be only on the pro plan. But it's also important for us to kind of see the value of those on the free plan. So we don't really have a way to track, you know, who's engaging in the Slack community, who are avid users, um, that sort of thing that actually is bringing value to us as a company or could bring value if we convert them into paying customers. Um, we're just finding it hard to sort of track that. And I, I think it might be something like loyalty uh, or something similar, but we, we're struggling with that part of our business, to be honest. All right, thanks, Rana. Awesome question. Next up, we have Rachel. Okay, great. Hi, Joy. Hi, Rachel. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good, thanks. Wonderful. Well, we're coming to you from Team 22. Uh, thank you for sharing a little bit about those challenges and the struggles that you're seeing in your team. I, I would love to know from your standpoint, like revenue, team dynamic, customer overall, what specific measurables, like performance results, would you like to implement or, or really be looking at that's like, if we met these criteria, if we met these measurables, that would mean we were successful? Um, sure, yeah. So I could definitely afterwards kind of share the specifics with you. But for us, the, the key kind of metrics that we're looking at is our um, – conversion rate from prospects to leads. So coming uh, kind of from, well, actually, if we take a step back from visitors to prospects to leads. So those who interact with our content on the web or look at Slack um, uh, content um, to those who actually sort of engage in some way, whether it's sign up for a free trial um, or a free plan or just like look at Slack um content such as ebooks, um, guides, blog posts, that sort of thing, um, to actual, which would be, you know, our prospects to actual people that we can qualify as someone that's interested in purchasing a product. So we would like to track at each of those stages how many people we have in the sort of percentage conversion from one to the next is really important to us. I think with B2B, um, they're more interested in looking from qualified leads to actual opportunities where for us, it's, it's a smaller scale really. So we have bulk leads and, um, you know, sometimes they, they qualify, I mean, they convert into um, paying customers on the pro plan or just free customers, but we don't really go through that whole kind of protracted opportunity life cycle. We don't follow up on that. So for us, it's more about the, the individual individuals and the metrics we can see from visitors to prospects to leads. Um, I think that's really important in terms of metrics. Um, in terms of our team, we would like to see who's engaged on our CRM um, and who's not. Obviously, there's a very small amount of people who's actually on marketing cloud, so just our marketing team and myself, for example, would have access there, but um, or whole sales team. So my whole entire department will be on Salesforce, and they um, will have different kind of functions there. But um, I'm worried that. We're not and keeping it ask, up. Can yeah, I ask go ahead. About, like, how you measure engagement on uh, on that area? Um, in terms of who's using the platform and who's not. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So right now we don't. <laughs> that's the that's the problem. Is we don't really know who is using it and who's not. I think we find out when we're kind of looking at reports of converted leads or you know, um, yeah basically converted leads, we can just see that some of them have been stuck in certain stages for ages um, and nothing has been done. Um, so that's the only way, and it's a bit too late for us to find out then, you know, so we don't really have a way uh, to track engagement right now, um, unless I go physically in and check every single lead, right. which would be impossible because um, there's so many. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. Heidi, you are up next. Hi, Heidi. Hello, Joy. How are you today? 
I'm fine, thanks. And you? <laughs> I'm doing well, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to visit with us today. And we just wanted to ask um, if there's certain functions that you see that stand out that are really recommended that you would think over to the B to B side. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we've had some discussions with the B to B department and They've been very excited. I think for us, it, it works pretty well. Um, so I think, you know, just the the actual individual contact tracking feature that we have currently in CRM works really well for us. So we have these individuals and we can see kind of the history of who's engaged with them, what activities has taken place in terms of calls, emails, and so on. And so we can get a good insight of, of people. Um, and I think that B2B is quite excited about that because even though they're selling to companies, they're still interacting with you know, individuals. So I think they're quite excited about that relationship building aspect of tracking um, the activity for individuals. So that's one thing that I, I picked up. I think they're quite excited about the opportunity management life cycle. Like I said, for us, that's not really something we use. We do use the opportunity object in Salesforce as far as I know, but it's a very short kind of path pathway that it follows sales path essentially because you know either they, they take the pro plan or they don't. Um, it's not really something that we try to sell over a long period of time and that needs to be approved internally and externally or anything like that. So um, for us, it's it's almost token, but I think for B2B, it could be very useful if they have a very specialized, or not specialized, but customized sales cycle, which is, um, you know, I'm sure Ezra told you all about that, mm -hmm. that is specific to them that you can build in. And I'm not sure whether the platform will allow for both of those things to coexist, but I think that will be very useful for them too. All right, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Heidi. Okay, we've got Catherine up. Hi, Catherine. Trying to get unmute myself. Sorry about that. So, hi, Joy. Hi. Yeah, thanks for taking the time off to meet uh, me and definitely to share with me the, uh, the the challenges that you are facing in your company and how we can better work together to meet uh, to make uh, for better solutions to be uh, implemented for the B two C. And uh, this is a follow up meeting by my colleague Ryan, who yesterday met um, Ezra. VP of uh, Revenue, B2B. To, to so from, from that conversation, uh, we, what we do understand is um, uh, much, of, uh, much of B2C's challenges were revolving all around data. And uh, you've shared actually the challenges that you are right now faced with those of uh, uh, lack of visibility, data visibility and uh, mm -hmm. everyone being able to see everything. But my concern at the moment is um, uh, regarding to the B2B, was there a legacy system that was used to track data for B2C cells that you're running on? And if so, what were the ma major challenges during uh, immigration of data to Salesforce? Sure. Uh, so unfortunately, I can't help you too much there, Catherine. I think we're quite different from B2B in the sense that we started out on Salesforce quite soon. Um, so like I said before, it was when we were just kind of a scrappy startup. It was like email, spreadsheets, um, and, you know, I think just swivel chairing between different systems and then um, we invested in Salesforce and everything is there and now it's been more than five years um, so we're pretty um, uh, 
what is the right word, settled on Salesforce and we have been for some time. So we didn't really move from any legacy system or had to integrate. Um, I think it's a great question as well, but um, I think we're different from B2B in that sense. I know that they're using some legacy systems, several, in fact. I, I'm not sure which ones. I'm sure Ezra told you all about them. Um, but I think that's a unique challenge for them. We didn't really face the same issue. Oh, that sounds good. And it's good to know that. Can I ask one more question? Please? No, I'm sorry. We've got to keep it moving. We keep people keep raising. Right. Thank you. Those, those <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Maybe put that put your follow up in the chat. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. uh, and that could be good in case someone else needs a question or um, you could raise your hand again, but I want to make sure it gets in. So gracious, you should be able to unmute yourself. Um. Hello, Joy. Hi, Gracious. How are you doing? I'm good and yourself. Uh, I'm from Group 2. And thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to make a follow-up interview uh, from oh. last night where we had an interview with Ezra. Um, sure. We understand that you've got uh, some problems that you faced in Salesforce itself, um, despite the fact that you've been using it for five years. Could you, mm -hmm. other than the data issues, what other problem did you face with Salesforce that you would wish for it to be changed? Other than the data visibility issues, um, I think the, like I said, the one thing when we started, like I said, I think Salesforce um, primarily is out of the box or from its inception, more focused on B2B sales, so more account focused. And we, at the time, had to kind of, so we started with um, person accounts, essentially, in Salesforce. So we try to focus on the individual. Um, we're not tracking companies at all. Um, so we have these person accounts that represents individual people. And I think it's evolved quite a bit, but in the beginning, it was a bit tough to kind of maintain the information. Um, but now it's it's more streamlined. Uh, other than that, I think uh, also with the you know the creating opportunities once a lead is qualified, it's a bit of an onerous task for us. Like I said, um, we are struggling actually um, as our department to differentiate because you know we have the free plan and um, the pro plan. And so for free plan, we're not we're not going to use opportunities really because we're not getting any revenue. We're not going to recognize any revenue from that. But we do want to track um, that so we have someone who's using our free plan. So currently we're kind of creating this dummy opportunity that's kind of closed by itself and has a different type that is so that we can report on all the people using our free plan. Um, but it seems a bit clunky, clunky to me. Um, and I think it, it can kind of mess with our revenue data when we look at opportunities and the statuses and so on. We have to be quite specific about how we filter it. And it's, it's just not elegant. Um, so I think that's another issue that we have is like trying to track these free plans um, or individuals that are on free plans. Um, because like I said, it's important for us to know who they are and that they are using our, our products because, you know, we want to invest in loyalty. We want to invest in advocates, brand advocates. And also we might want to try to convert those folks to paid products as well. Um, so that's why it's important to us. But right now, it, it doesn't feel like we have a good way of, of tracking the free customers versus paying customers, if that makes sense. All right. Thank you, Joy. Thank you Thank for your Thanks, Gracious. Thanks, Gracious. Right. Tim, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, Joy. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks, Tim. How are you? I'm well. I'm uh, from... Team 11, and I wanted to go back. You talked earlier about some struggles with user adoption, mm -hmm. and uh, I was wondering if you could talk to me about the strategies you use to encourage uh, adoption, and is there anything that you would do differently now that uh, to encourage your team to... Um, start using Salesforce and? 
Yeah, great question, Tim. So I think the problem is like we're a really fast moving business. And especially on in our department, we have a, a high volume of um, work to deal with. So a lot of leads coming in, as you can imagine, people using free versions of Slack um, or just the pro version as well. Uh, so I'm, you know, I, I'm reluctant to say, but unfortunately, it's the case we don't really have a, a really good strategy for adoption. Um, so it's kind of ended up with being more of a sort of um, reactive strategy where we kind of, you know, when we end up in meetings or we look at these reports of leads and we see that, you know, things haven't moved or data hasn't been updated, it's kind of you know, not kind of reprimanding the, the folks who are responsible for it and, and, and not instead of incentivizing, you know, adopting the system beforehand. And that's one of the major issues for us. Um, and for me specifically, is I would love to move to a, a way of encouraging using Salesforce and updating your records and keeping it up to date um, instead of this kind of reactive version of looking at data when it's a bit too late and then trying to trying to um, fix it. And so, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of where we are. That's very helpful. I appreciate your time, Joy. Thanks, Tim. Okay. Uh, hey, Joy. Hi, is Dave. It, How are you? It sounds like Mallory is uh, maybe stepped away from some internet issues there. So I, I think I'll just go right ahead. If that's okay, Joy, it sounds like you're doing well today. I am too. Um, quick question for you, and, and it has to do with our purview as uh, the BA that you've hired to, to discuss these issues. Uh, we have to make the decision sooner or later whether or not we're going to integrate B2B into the same instance of Salesforce that you're presently using. And I'd like to know whether or not that gives you any concern about uh, kind of sharing your Salesforce, if you will, with the B2B side of the business and also whether or not we have to worry about any type of uh, turf wars that are um, internal to your business that we might have to work through in order to make that happen if that's what we decide to do. Or is it in your best interest to do a separate uh, instance of Salesforce for the other um other side of the business, the B2B business, instead of integrating them together. Yeah, thanks, Dave. I'm so glad you asked that question. I think if you ask my team, they would say, no way, don't let them get into our um, instance. They're very territorial about things and they're, um, like I said before, quite resistant to change. But I think it's a good point. Um, I think it will definitely be in our interest as a company to have both um, both of our streams in one place where we can get a total view because at the end of the day, a lot of our individual customers actually work at companies that are also customers. Um, so there will be certainly overlap and we would love to track that whole relationship um, across from individual use to, uh, to kind of enterprise use. So I think, I would say it's it's definitely in our interest. Our team maybe not so much. So I think there was, you know, just to give you some background, there was a bit of a war internally about the the pro version, whether that's actually B two C versus B two B, um, and there is definitely an overlap there and and a lot of uh, opportunity for moving on to the higher tier, which is business. So there is a handoff between our teams as well. Um, so that's also another reason why it'd be great to have us all in one system. But I wouldn't say that we're, unfortunately, always working um, together in the best way. Um, so I think, you know, the, the other thing that we're concerned about, and it's a concern for me as well, even though I'm in favor of bringing them on board, is one, the thing that I already mentioned around visibility and, and data sensitivity. Um, we already don't have that sorted out within our business. And now to bring in a whole other um, you know, segment, it's going to be tough um, 
or you know hopefully you can figure it out but i don't know how it's going to happen but we need to be sure that our data issues are solved before we bring in b2b um so that's the one thing that i'm concerned about and then the other thing is like how would it work with the different sales cycles between B2C and B2B? Would the platform be able to accommodate both? Um, would there be some confusion, some conflict? That's that's another thing that we, we're not really sure of yet. That's perfect. Thank you for the information. I'll yield the floor. Thanks, Dave. Nice, right. Dave. Hi, Joy. Hello, uh, I'm Stephanie, I'm with Group 19. Um, mm -hmm. And we were wondering, you've talked a lot about how you're currently using Salesforce, how you're currently, um, your concerns for what's going on right now. Um, we spoke yesterday with Ezra who had expressed that he was planning on the B2B side for about a 30 to 40% growth year over year in the next coming years, um, really flexing the needs and the ability to scale the instance that we build for them. I'm curious what your growth looks like on the B2C side and whether there's any scale concerns that you currently have. Yeah, I, I mean, I think for the last year or so, um, our growth has been pretty consistent around between like 15 to 20%. And I, I don't think that we have any major concerns about scale, to be honest, because it is tapering a bit down um, on the BTC side, as you can see, even our product features are more focused on the B2B um, and the pay packages. So I, I, I don't think we, we're we looking at that consistent growth that we've seen so far. Um, it might taper down at some point, but uh, I don't actually see any issues of scale in the next couple of years for our side. Great. That's great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Stephanie. Hi, Leonard. Hi, Joy. Um, so I'm just representing our team three. Um, thank you for your time. I've just got one uh, quick question for you. Is, um, is there any other users that we should be talking to with implementing, um, oh, so to do with the implementation of um, uh, Salesforce into the uh, B2C side of um, Slack? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, I'm sure each of my team would love you to uh, speak to them individually, but I know that's not, probably not possible. So quite a bit of stakeholders. I think from what we've said before, I think it's really important for you to talk to our data privacy and compliance team. Um, so they will be able to give you all the information around the different uh, regulations across the regions um, and the issues that we're facing today. Um, so very important to speak to them. Um, and then I'd love to love for you to speak to kind of the sales head for each of our, our different geographical regions as well. Um, and they have slightly different targets and slightly different strategies as well. So um, it'd be good to, to speak to them all. Oh, great. And uh, would also the finance team be a, another team to look at? Just um yes uh certainly i think you know our finance team is is kind of a monolith <laughs> so they will cover both b2c b2b stuff um so i'm sure Ezra also mentioned that uh, you should definitely speak to them um but be sure to ask specifically about the the b2c processes because they might just um chat to you primarily around b2b since we're kind of on the the lower concern scale of the finances in that sense. Oh, great. Um, no, that's all I had. I'll, um, I'll uh, yield the floor to uh, Shelley. Thanks, Leonard. Hi, Shelley. Hi, Joy. Um, I'm actually also on the same team as Leonard, but um, so I was wondering, um, besides your sales team, what other departments are currently using the same Salesforce instance as the B2C team? 
Yeah, I I don't think unless I've missed something, there's no one else uh, on Salesforce currently using except B2C. Um, so that will be sales and we have some sales operations folks on there as well. And then our marketing team, which of course uh, there is a B2C division within marketing, but I think both B2C and B2B have some hand in using Marketing Cloud, which is integrated to our Salesforce uh, core platform. Um, but those are the only teams that I'm aware of. Okay. Because um, I'm wondering if it'll be helpful for other teams such as maybe compliance or legal to mm. participate in terms of overseeing the data privacy aspects. Because I know with things like GDPR, the California Consumer Pri Privacy Act or other things that it, it might be too much for the sales team to handle on their own, but um, yeah. we will, oh, go ahead. No, no, I think that's that's a great idea. I think um, right now, all of the communication around compliance and legal is happening kind of offline or, you know, in Slack um, with these folks. So I think it'll be really good uh, to have uh, people on the platform that they can actually see what data is being collected and, and who sees what. And like I said, that's a major issue for us. So right now they don't actually have access. So if they did, um, perhaps we can start working towards better compliance as well. So I think that's a great idea. Okay, thank you so much for your time. Sure, thanks Shelley. Morning, Joe, Eduardo from Team 25. Hey, and Eduardo. It's not morning for you, it's morning for me. I believe it's evening for you. But um, I think uh, based on the information that Ezra talked to us, it seems like they currently, uh, what they currently do is work on, mainly when it comes to the revenue and contracts, right? And it's very cumbersome, cumbersome and they have to track everything manually. So that's the main way of tracking. Yeah, leave, leave. How, or how different is it for you on the B2B Oh, excuse me, B2C, right? I know you talked about the free clients and so on, but how do you track revenue? How do you measure this? And in, in regards to that, what, I don't know if you have, he said that you guys do some cool things there with automation. I don't know if you do any automation when it comes to the revenue tracking and so on. Sure. Um, hi, Eduardo. So yeah, it's, um, I think it's quite different between the two divisions, really, or the two segments. Um, like uh, you mentioned, Ezra might have spoken to you about their contracts, their kind of um, negotiation and so on. Um, for us, recognizing revenue is pretty simple. So either it's just the free plan, which is no revenue, um, or it is just a standard product. So we have one product um, uh, in the, the system that can be associated with an opportunity, um, and that is on the pro plan. And that's just a simple per person uh, fee. And um, so subscription. And that's that's basically it. So it's very straightforward for us. I'm sure it's very different for B2B because I know that with the enterprise grid version, you can negotiate contracts and it depends on the number of users and all of that. It becomes really complicated, I'm sure. But for us, um, just a single product, it's just the quantity that differentiates the total value. Um, and it's a very short sales cycle. So is it very month to month or is it just a one-time payment? It's either it's either monthly or annually. Okay. So you can choose. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. I no yield problem. the floor to Kahin. Thanks. Hi Kahinde. Hello. Hi, Joy. Hi. I'm well. Thank you for the insight. Thank you for all the information. Uh, I'm wondering, how do you generate leads? And how do customers get back to you about cases management and feedback for your team specifically? Hmm. So, um, you know, the, the simplest way, we there's a number of ways for us to kind of generate leads. But um, the simplest way, and it's not so much lead, it actually just goes straight to an opportunity, but it, it's an automated like lead closure, is when people just sign up for the free plan on the Slack website. 
So they would sign up and it will take them through the process of actually setting up their Slack instance. But in the background, we'll get a, um, a sort of, um, I think we use Salesforce web to lead actually specifically for that. Um, and then some additional automation to navigate them to their new Slack instance. But for us, it just creates a lead and essentially converts it within Salesforce immediately uh, when they sign up for the free version. But we do want to kind of interact with that uh, that person uh, further on if we can like move them over to a paid plan. Um, so that's fairly simple for um, for our pro plan. Um, it's the basically we would go back to a, a journey in marketing cloud where the leads that are converted for on the free plan and um, the opportunity is also closed one. Um, we would send that into a journey in marketing cloud to contact the individual at certain stages about trying the free trial of the pro plan or like encouraging them to sign up with different kind of drip campaigns, strategies and so on. And then um, we do have, you know, a couple of other ways to do it. That's the, the simplest and the, the easiest and preferred way that we track our leads, but we can also um, track them from landing pages on social media where we like, are you interested in Slack and so on. Um, but for the most part, since we're not kind of trying to sell them the, the business or the enterprise plan, it's just that they've physically just sign up um, to use Slack and that's how, how we get their information and start tracking them. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you all so much for understanding uh, my technical issues. Yamini, we have you up. <laughs> Hi, Joy. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'm from Team 10. Great. Hi, Amelia. Nice to meet you. Yeah, hi. And uh, now I understood you are having some um, pain points on the compliances, and also you are using the marketing cloud also. So mm -hmm. I, I hope you are using, uh, you are maintaining the camp span on the um, um, mailing systems and everything you are following over there. And also, can may I know what are the different domains that means the customers you are going to handle like healthcare or any other kinds of um, customers you have to handle so that we may need to go for the car like HIPAA rules all those compliances we may need to implement so what are those and another one is you are having the monthly and annually subscriptions you are having and how you are maintaining the amendments in between if any changes are coming so if the customer is asking for any changes, so how you are handling all those right now? Mm -hmm. um, cool. Thanks, Yamini, for those two questions. I think, so to your first question um, around the domains and the compliance required. Um, so we do track, you know, when, when people sign up for the free version of that. We uh, do track kind of their interests and their industry. We have that as sort of a, um, a well, I think it's called a pick list in Salesforce, and we do track that. And so I must say we don't do too much with that information right now, unfortunately. So I think we're fine Like when it comes to things like HIPAA. We're not tracking kind of individual information about clients or anything. So we we... we our legal team says we're fine on that sort of thing. Um, but our, our concerns are, you know, just around the geographic locations and the consumer protection policies like GDPR um, and uh, California. Yeah, California. <laughs> um, so I think that's one thing. We have the information. We do have, you know, people's industries or domains. We have their region when they sign up. But right now, unfortunately, we're not doing any kind of specific implementation of um, protection of data. So that's something we really need to do. Um, so we have the data, we just don't have the, the implementation, which is one of the things that we're hoping to solve with this project. Um, so that's the one thing. And then your second question was around um, changing or amendments within um, 
the plans. So I think for us, it's it's fairly simple. There's only kind of two ways it can go. They go from the free plan to pro or they downgrade from pro um, back to the free plan. Um, I think it's much more complex with the B2B side, um, as Ezra might have mentioned, because there they can track like kind of, you know, pricing differences and number of users and features and so on, depending on what plan they're on. So that might be a bit more contractual, heavy and um, complicated. But for us, it's pretty standard. Um, so we just kind of track it within our um, opportunity product schedule. So for, like I said, the product, there's only one product and that's the pro plan per person or per user. And so we have our schedules if they're on a monthly basis or annual base, uh, basis, sorry. Then, um, you know, if there are uh, requests or amendments, we just kind of, uh, if it's monthly, we, you know, cancel out everything past the last um, payment date. Um, and if it's annual, uh, it's immediate, basically after the, the current payment. So that's, it's very easy for us to check those things. Um, and we don't currently have any issues with that. So, okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Yamini. Okay, I just want to bring up that we have Miranda, Misato, Lillian, and Vandana, and then that will need to be um, the end of our questions so that uh, we can bring in our coach, Izelle, from where she's been taking a break, and get some <laughs> feedback from her. Okay, we've got Miranda. Miranda, are you able to unmute yourself? Okay, yeah. Yes. Hi, Joy. Uh, I'm Miranda, the BA with uh, Group 18. And I heard that when you first signed up for Salesforce, it was a little while ago. Um, are your users now, are they more comfortable in the classic mode of this, your Salesforce instance? Or are we have we moved to the Lightning version? Um, and do you guys have like any superstars that really, I know that you guys are a little bit reactive to tracking um, how your users are actually using your Salesforce instance. Um, but do we have like any rock stars to help with, with that kind of help? Cool. Hi, Miranda. I just love that you asked that question. Um, so on the first part, we are fully lightning um, and we have been for a number of years. So um, don't, you don't have to worry about any classic conversion um i think even before my time uh they were all on lightning already so we're fine there i think with the you know the users and adoption we definitely see a disparity there is a handful of people that are like, like you said superstars with using the platform keeping their data up to date um and they help others they're really great and then there are those that um, either need a bit more help and understanding and using it or that just don't care. So um, uh, I think we're not really utilizing those superstars as much as we could. Uh, I think if there was a strategy or some way or to incentivize and to include them, I think that would be wonderful. But right now we, we don't really use the full potential of what they're bringing to the team. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thanks, Miranda. Miranda. All right. With Masato up next. And Masato, you are muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. That happens in every call in your Salesforce life. It'll happen, right? <laughs> I turned on my video, but I didn't uh, unmute myself. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you so much, Joy, for taking this time to answer all our difficult questions. I'm sure it's exhausting, <laughs> but I just have one question for you. If that's okay. Mm -hmm. So based on the interview with Ezra yesterday, he expressed his hope to be able to collaborate with others, other uh, team members within his department. Uh, for example, like sales team, people can really like communicate with the management or the finance team. Um, mm. And I was wondering if your department uses any, um, for example, like Slack or Chatter to kind of make that conversation more smooth between the employees. 
Yeah, um, great question, Masato. So we, we like I said before, I can't remember who asked the question, but we um, currently just have our sales and sales operations um, and some marketing people on Salesforce. So we do try to use Chatter there, but I, th I feel also it's another adoption issue. Like people don't really use it um, as much as they could. And I see a lot of emails still going around referencing, you know, things that could be done within the platform. So that's one part. And then we use Slack internally, of course, we, uh, we drink our own Kool-Aid, um, but Basically, that's where we engage with all of the other teams, whether it's B2B, whether it's, you know, legal compliance, someone else asked about that as well, um, and our execs, uh, like our, our management as well. Um, and it can be quite cumbersome because we'd have to go and export reports from Salesforce or download dashboard components and then paste them into Slack and so on. Um, so... I'm sure that there are integrations and better ways to do it, but we're not currently doing that. So that's definitely room for improvement for us. Thanks. Hi, Lillian. Oh. Sorry, I didn't unmute myself. Lillian, come on up. Hi, sorry. <laughs> Hi, Joy. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. So I wanted to ask, I'm Lillian, by the way, from uh, Team 27. Um, I wanted to ask, um, my question is two in one. I want to ask, what does success look like for you as the VP of sales? And... Also, what's the one process that you wouldn't want to change from the current uh, B2C processes to the B2B processes? Yeah, um, well, you're asking the tough questions, Lillian. Um, no, I think, um, no, it's, it's good. I think for success, what does success look like? I think if, um, you know, I'm sure there's there our team has worked on specific metrics in terms of uh, lead conversion times that we can improve, and there's some numbers they can put to it. But if we can see an improvement of the amount of time it takes our leads to convert from free to pro trials, that would be you know great. I, I would say like if 10 to to 30 percent improvement in those conversion rates would be wonderful. Um, that would that would be I would say that would would be success and and when we can also hand off our our leads to B two B in a in a better way I'm not sure exactly what the metric for that would be but if we can say that there's a smooth handoff and like an improvement of um, handing over leads from the free and pro plans to to business um, that would also be be great. And then in terms of just a coherency in our team, like having um, a way of saying that people are using our, our platform CRM and um, they're using it to its full potential and um, it's improving their productivity. Uh, I don't know also what that would look like, but I think if we can say that our team is productive um, and pooling together in the same direction, that's, that's kind of success in my mind. Um, I forgot your, oh, what, what, what is something that we'd like to, to keep? Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, once again, it's kind of that individual level view. Um, so being able to see the full 360 of a, of a specific individual, their engagements and their affiliations, um, if we can keep that going, even when we go to B2B, because like I said before, some of our individual customers, B2C, also are involved in companies, other companies, um, where they might be stakeholders or decision makers for companies as well. So we need to track both of their sort of or all of their engagements. So if we can keep that consistent throughout bringing B2B on board, I think that will be a major plus for us. Thank you so much, Joy.
Thank you, Thanks, Lillian. Lillian. Bandana, come on up and unmute yourself. Ramya, depending on how fast we get through this, we might be able to fit you in, Ramya. So hang on, but let me see. <laughs> hey, Zil. Uh, Vandana here, something 26. So my question is, as uh, Slack is supporting B2C with the current Salesforce instance, and uh, it has to support both B2C and B2B with the same uh, Salesforce instance. So there might be few pain points. I wanted to know what pain points that might have. Um, yeah, for B2B, I mean, for B2C, like I said before, our major pain point is data visibility. Um, so people having access to data that they perhaps shouldn't have, um, especially when we think about compliance in terms of um, data protection policies across the world in different regions. It's at different levels and different requirements. So right now we don't have a good um, uh, policy to adhere to that. So it's kind of manual or on a case-to-case -case basis, but we really would love to have a system that by default, you know, that we are adhering to all of the data um, compliance policies and um, we can just onboard users without worrying like how how to assign like who sees what um so that is our major pain point i think for btc and the um the other thing that i mentioned was just kind of the understanding of how to track the free plan customers versus pro plan so free we don't actually have any revenue to recognize but we do want to track them and, and their engagement with our brand um, and so like also trying to attribute the value that they bring and recognizing the value that they bring um, to the company so that's another thing that we don't really do right now which is a pain point for us sure thank you sure thanks Oh, Mallory, you're mute. Sorry. He happens to the best of us. Uh, <laughs> George, you have two more questions. Inya, I think you can handle two more. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, go. Okay, Ramya and Teo, you will be the last ones. Hi, hey, Ramya. Oh, hey, Joy. Um, can I, thank you for this opportunity to ask you the question. Um, so uh, uh, regards to the support, um, what is the process do you guys follow for the B2C part um, for the customers' uh, cases, you know, like if they have any issues, uh, how do they, uh, how do you handle that? Yeah, great question. Um, so we currently have Zendesk. We use um, the tool Zendesk for our uh, kind of ticketing platform. Um, and we integrate it to Salesforce. So all of the Zendesk tickets are um, also replicated essentially into Salesforce as cases and attached to, um, to the individuals, the, the contacts within Salesforce, so that we can see kind of like the history of the cases that they've had and how it's been resolved. But we don't actually have, as I mentioned before, we don't actually have our support team or our customer care team sitting in Salesforce um, and being having the luxury of looking at the customer detail because it's a one-way integration. So from Zendesk, um, we just basically replicate that case data into Salesforce so that our sales team knows what's happening. Um, but I must say, I think they rarely use that, uh, unfortunately. I, I would love to see a more integrated view of, I would love actually, firstly, for our customer care team to be in Salesforce and um, that everyone can see this like full view of what the customer has spoken to or who they've spoken to about things um, and what the, the issues were that they faced in, in the past and and how we can like really personalize our interactions and, and we don't have that right now. All right, thank you, Ramya. Okay, Tayo or Tayo, sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Your final yeah. question, Roy. 
Okay, thank you. You you got it right, style. Thank you so much, Joy. Um, so we spoke. I'm from Team Nineteen, uh, Team Thirteen. Sorry, um, we spoke um, extensively with Ezra yesterday. Um, I just want to know um, if there will be an overlap in maybe data or anything by the time um, B two B is implemented. Um, Salesforce is implemented for B2B, and if there will be any, um, what aspects do you think will be impacted? And again, I have um, like a second question. Um, is there a policy around the file size for that B2C um, implements at the moment that you think we should put into consideration while um, implementing Salesforce for B2B? Cool, uh, thanks Taya for the questions. I think just I'll start with your uh, second one. I think that's a good point you raised. There's no policy on our side, but we have had issues where we get um, kind of responses from our IT team or from those who manage our licenses on Salesforce that we're hitting up our limits on, on file storage. So they've had to increase that a number of times. So I think that's a good point. We haven't really thought about it or discussed it, but um, that's a good point to consider is like if we can limit the file sizes perhaps or, you know, something in that line, we can uh, decrease our need to constantly <laughs> increase our um cost for file storage on Salesforce. That's definitely an issue we have right now. Um, and then on to your first question regarding the overlap of data. Um, yeah, like I said, uh, certainly for the individual data for contacts for people in our database will be relevant to the B2B business as well, because um, there will be individuals that might have their own personal Slack account and then they also represent a business where they have their business email or their business account as well. But we do want to see a holistic view of that individual across everything they do in the company, not just their kind of personal persona versus business persona. So that's definitely where the overlap. And I, I think that will be challenging um, because, you know, they will use their personal email maybe to sign up if they're a consultant or just sign up with, you know, individually for Slack versus their work email if they sign up for their business or they're a representative of their business. So I think that might be a challenge. Okay, thank you so much. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Teo. Um, I'm going to let, see you later, Joy. Bye, thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> sure, we'll see you later on in the project. Let me take a few uh, look at um look at the questions here. There are a little bit more general. Uh, like, is it good practice for BAs to schedule follow up interviews with stakeholders if other issues come up later in the process? That's a great question. Um, to to let Izel, you know, uh, come back on stage, give her a little bit of time to uh, relax, get a drink. Um. Normally in a discovery process, you know, you're not just thrown in with somebody for one day and then you, you know, are off to the races, uh, off to, off to build your project. Hopefully you get a few sessions, you know, scheduled out. You can start off with a, with a certain line of questioning, see where it takes you. You could also discover, like Joy told us that, oh, we need to talk to the technical team about this. This isn't something that Joy knows about. Or so you, um, People kind of just crop up uh, occasionally as you go through projects um, or go through discoveries. So um, definitely uh, it should be something that's sort of accounted for in your discovery work. And it's also very important. It's okay if your stakeholder doesn't have the answer. Hopefully you have some other questions prepared, but also it's just great to get to know that you'll need to speak to, you know, person B or person C and perhaps involve them in a certain way that perhaps wasn't anticipated by your team or by the client's team. So that is one that's a little bit more general. Um, and then I'm going to let Izel give some feedback um, before we go into some of the more specific ones that are in the chat. Izel, any feedback for our participants? 
Sure. I, I kind of wish that I like changed my sweater or something just to <laughs> mark the difference. Um, but yeah, once again, you know, I think Mallory, we've done a few of these and every time I'm just so um, impressed and delighted with, you know, the, the quality of the questions and what everyone brings uh, to these sessions. I'm just really impressed. Actually, there was some um, really good but tough questions for me that I, I probably should have thought a bit more about what I wanted to say, you know, like in terms of how to measure success, some of the automations and things like that. That was great, great questions to ask your stakeholder. Um, so I was really impressed by this. I think, you know, uh, just in terms of like some constructive feedback, I think a lot of folks would, uh, you know, the one question rule is a tough one. So a lot of people came up with kind of a couple compound questions that they put together. And I think just the thing to, to keep in mind, I know this isn't really a real life scenario and you don't have this rule where you just have the one question necessarily, but be careful not to um, put questions together that don't really belong together or are, you know, like confusing. Um, you know, uh, you might have follow-up questions, but try to start simple, make it easy for your stakeholder to answer one thing and then follow up on that. Or, you know, try to, to, to break it out logically for them because it can be hard for them to keep track of, of what you're asking if there's more than one sort of question mark in that um, that paragraph. So just keep that in mind. I hope that I, I was able to, to keep track of all the questions, the compound questions, um, and answer them accordingly. But just in real life, keep that in mind. Um, it's not always going to be easy for your stakeholder to, to keep track of that. And the information you get back from them might not be as useful if you kind of throw a double question at them. Um, so that's the one thing that I picked up. Uh, let me just see, I wrote down some things here. Not that I can really read my own handwriting. Oh, the other the other thing was just know your audience. I think Mallory just mentioned it as well here. So a couple of times I said, ask my technical team, even though as me as Zazel, I could probably make up some things technically to talk to you about automation and so on. Um, your head of revenue isn't necessarily going to know these things. So just, just be prepared when you speak to someone specifically or a, a group of people. Remember who you're talking to and try to gauge where to pitch your questions at. You know, what might they know and what might they not know? And um, also just pivot in case they say, like, I really don't know that. Um, then you can ask who should I speak to? Who might know this? Um, so it's not a it's not a dead end, and it's also not the end of the world if you maybe pitch your questions at the wrong level, not level, um, kind of long, wrong persona. Um, but just try to follow up and um, and make the most of what you have. Um, yeah, and then just on the positive side, so much to say there. Just a more practical thing. I really loved that um, some of you put your cameras on. I know it's not always possible in these these learning experiences and these sprints, um, but I, I think it just really shows your engagement and it's really nice for the stakeholder to, to read your facial expressions as well and, and kind of have that engagement. So where possible, in real life, if you are doing these things virtually, do try to, to do those small things like turn on your camera. Um, but it, it will be different for each interaction. And it's, like I said, it's not always possible. Um, and yeah, I think it was really good, really critical questions. I think this session, I didn't really see any repeats, um, which shows to me like you've really listened to what other people was asking and building onto that. And I think that's that's wonderful. Um, so really impressed by that. And I think you really covered the whole gambit. Who was it, uh, Ramya, who asked about support? I think someone else also maybe, and I didn't really answer that question. My apologies. 
but um, bringing in kind of something that is a critical process for a company, um, but maybe wasn't in the brief so much. When we talk about like the head of revenue and, and sales, you don't really think immediately about support, but bringing that also into the picture, they might not be your key stakeholder for talking about support processes, but asking them where does this fit into the picture, I think that was great as well. Um, yeah, I just, great, great. Great work, everyone. Thank you. Um, we've got a general question. Are there any go-to tools that BAs use for note-taking during such long and inform informative sessions? Anything from apart from paper and pen, typing on Google Docs? Um, I'll, I'll give a little answer uh, and then let Isabel answer. I know a lot of times we really love to have two people in the meeting and one of them is a note-taker. Uh, and I have swapped this with teammates who are, you know, kind of in my organization, several levels above me. Sometimes I'm taking notes for them. Sometimes they're taking notes for me. Uh, I, I think our teams recognize the importance of keeping that, you know, that interviewer very engaged and not worried about taking notes, you know, no matter like who they are. So um, first off, there's that, but that's not always possible. It's not it's not possible at every company. It's not possible in every engagement. You may have tools like that you're required to use. Like, oh, we all, we all need to keep our discovery documentation in this format. Um, so I like to, sometimes I'll use um, a whiteboarding tool and it can be nice to like, some, sometimes it's nice to have it up on the screen with your stakeholder. Sometimes it's not. Um, I just ran a discovery where we did use Miro, a virtual whiteboarding tool, and we were kind of categorizing our ideas. And it was good for that engagement because they could give me feedback and say, oh, you know what? Let's actually put that in a different category. Or can we add this idea, you know, to this category? So we were kind of working collaboratively. It's not always what you want to do. Um, Izelle, any tools that you like to use for note taking um, during sessions like this? Sure, yeah, I um, can't agree with you more, Mallory, about having the second person taking notes. So that's the same with us. We'd always have at least two folks um, that the facilitator is kind of free to engage with the stakeholders in the session, ask the questions, guide the conversation, um, and so on, and can trust in, in the, the other person taking the notes, however they choose to do that. Um, like you said, not always possible, in which case I would always recommend where possible record a session, even if it's in person, ask for permission, of course, and sometimes they'll say no, I haven't actually ever come across any, any client saying no to recording a session, but it, you know, it's still something that you need to be sure that they're comfortable with. But um, it's so useful to record these sessions so that you can go back, even when you did have a note taker, a dedicated note taker, it can be useful for you if you're working on the project to go back and, and listen to the recording, um, pick up some additional thing that you might have missed um, and so on. So that's that's very important. I agree, Miro's great. Other whiteboarding tools like um, Lucid Spark, for example, or I um, uh, like Lucid Chart. So you know your next assignment is to do process flows. And sometimes I like doing a rough draft of that in these sessions. So if especially if you have two people and someone can actually start like building out those process flows as you talk, you can get um, in time, like uh, in real time affirmation or kind of an indication from the stakeholders if you're on the right track and if they agree with how you're starting to build out these processes um, so that you have a higher level of fidelity or kind of um, assurance of the correctness of the information when you come back and, and show them your process flows. Um, and it's just, it's nice to get on the same page early on. So if it's possible, definitely try that, give it a shot. Um, it's not always possible, <laughs> especially if you're on your own. Um, in which case I would just say, try to record the session um, because even if you're taking notes yourself, uh, you probably are not gonna be able to be fully present and take all of the notes that you want to. So always have a backup. That's awesome. I did have a client who restricted our recordings one time and we, okay. couldn't, we couldn't record if there wasn't like a script. So if it was like a training we were giving or something, we could record, but it was so interesting, you know, and they, I mean, 
they didn't make the policy. The people I was speaking with didn't make the policy. And so anyway, we all chuckled about it a little bit. But uh, we have another great question. Is it possible to send main questions in a written form and receive the answers before the interview, then have discussions around those answers and follow up questions? So once again, I'll give Zell a little time to breathe. Um, you, When you work with clients like this in a, in a consulting or a VA uh role, you are taking time away from their work day. They have another whole nine to five generally. Even if the client provides internal resources, those internal resources are kind of like helping you interview these stakeholders sometimes. Uh, so you have to be careful about that. You don't want to say, oh, I'm going to put on this uh, hour and a half meeting and also, I want you to do a bunch of pre-work. So it's a fine line. You might think, oh, this is actually good. This is like a consideration. You can send an agenda or some, hey, we're going to talk about these four things. Please bring anything with you you think is, is um, you know, relevant. Or I, I have said, oh, do you have any reporting around this? particular uh, issue or something like that, ask for those things. But you don't want to, you don't want to ask for a lot of time before, before these meetings um, for that reason. Is Elle, any, any, any perspective? Yeah. About that? yeah, no, I agree. Absolutely. It's so, so important to respect your stakeholders time. Um, it also depend from person to person. Some people really want to know in advance and prepare. So also try to get a sense of who you're working with. Um, it's, you're always welcome to send questions, but um, be aware that you can't set the expectation that they'll answer that for you before a session. Um, like Mallory said, their time is valuable and you're expecting quite a bit of them to take time out, especially if you're talking to folks that aren't, that weren't involved in kind of the planning of the project, you know, they're your end users and, and they're kind of told by their boss to, to do this. Um, you want to try everything you can to make it as easy, painless, enjoyable as possible for them. So um, I definitely think it's always useful to help your stakeholder prepare um, and for those who are more um, wanting to have that sense of control, they will do that for you. Uh, um, and others will just want to show up and, and, and chat to you. So meet your stakeholder where they're at. Um, yeah, but uh, in some cases, it might be possible for you to do that. Awesome. Okay, everybody. Anything else that you missed during like for the process and everything? It's I just want to remind you all on these clicked challenges. It's okay to bring in assumptions. It's okay to fill in the blanks yourselves. That is what we do. The next thing you'll be doing are your process maps. So uh, next, all, all I have on the slide is next week's are the process maps. I don't think I am hosting that. So I'm not sure what day it's on. But um, Izel, do you know when that is necessary? Um, no, I'm not 100% sure. Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> I'm sure Jeff will will let everybody know when that is, but next week are your are your process maps. So um thank you for this. Go ahead, fill in those blanks. It's just fine. You all will have you have plenty to go off of um from Izel and from Joy. Uh thank you all for attending today and go figure out with your team your process maps uh for that kind of presentation. You'll be sharing your screen. So maybe you want to do a little bit of practice uh, with Airmeet on that. And we will see you all next week. Thanks. Bye. Bye.